Why do you think these things happen? Have you spent much time thinking about that? About what? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know the answers. Hiding in plain sight. The ability to just blend in, live that best double life. Many killers throughout history have been able to pull this off to varying different degrees, but there's always usually a little something that spills out into that perfect little facade. But nothing spilled out with Russell Williams. He had a neat and tidy little life with his wife, ascended to the highest possible level in his field, but underneath all that, something was a brewing, and when it finally arose to the surface, it would send shockwaves throughout the public and the Royal Canadian Air Force. Russell Williams was born March 7, 1963 in Bromsgrove, England, but was quickly uprooted as a child to Chalk River, Ontario, which is this tiny village of about 800 people and also home to Canada's premier nuclear research lab where Russell's dad got a job. Once they were there, Russell's parents soon had his younger brother Harvey. It seems to be pretty widely accepted that Russell doesn't fit the mold of, you know, your typical cold-blooded killer. Seemingly normal up bringing none of the usual glaring red flags or childhood trauma. But if you just peel back a layer or two, you know, despite whatever was hardwired there from birth, there were definitely some things that, you know, wouldn't necessarily turn 99.9% .9 of the population into uh, horrible murderers. But there were definitely a few significant life events that could have, you know, ever so gently nudged him in the wrong direction. For one, Russell's parents met this other couple, the Savkas, after they moved to Canada, and just a short bit into that, just, you know, beautiful blossoming friendship. Dad starts nailing Mrs. Savka, which tanks the marriage. Russell and his brother go off to live with their mom, who then marries Mr. Savka four months after finalizing her divorce. So just a full-on swap. Christine Williams, Russell's mom, would soon take on the name Nani Savka. Her middle name was Nani. And Russell Williams would become Russ Savka. The new family settled in Scarborough, Ontario, where Russell would take up piano lessons, deliver the Globe and Mail newspaper, and attend high school. Attending his last two years at UCC, which is one of the most prestigious elite private schools in all of Toronto. I don't know if this comes into play or not, but uh, while Russell was a boarding student at the school, there was a housemaster who was uh, well, doing inappropriate things with some of the boys there. Nothing's ever come out about anything happening to Russ while he was there, but you know, you never know. Russell's classmates described him as quiet, very focused on just killing it with the grades, but also talented musically. The trumpet was his thing. He also excelled in sports and was something of an amateur photographer. But around this time, Russell would have to get used to what would be a very common thing for him, which was being alone. Russell's stepdad was also in the nuclear field, and that would take him all over the world. Eventually, the family has to move to South Korea. Russell tried to go to school over there, but described it as a pretty horrible experience. He was called a yank. But Russell spent those last two years at UCC by himself while his family was back in South Korea. And, uh, you know, a lot of people described him as being lonely during that time. Graduates, goes on to attend the University of Toronto Scarborough, and again, his family just wasn't there. His stepdad had to oversee another project, this time in Hawaii, so his mom and stepdad lived there. Also, so his biological father lived in New York State, so just, you know, more alone time for young Russell. Fun fact, uh, Russell studied economics and political science at the University of Toronto Scarborough, and guess who also studied economics at the same time at the same school? Paul Bernardo! Nothing's ever come out whether they knew each other or were friends, but they went to the same school at the same time and I'm pretty sure had a couple of classes together at the same time. While Russell was going through university, he worked part-time at the university and also waited tables at Red Lobster. Thrill Sergeant would be the nickname assigned to Russell by his five college roommates because he would outline tasks for everybody. You do the dishes, you buy groceries, you do this, you do that. Just extremely structured. Every penny Russell spent was journaled on his little clipboard and so much as a fingerprint smudge on the metallic fridge would be enough to send Russ into a tizzy. Meticulous is a word that continues to come up when people are 
describing him. He was also just a little prankster. From time to time, when his roommates were gone, he would pick the locks to their rooms, wait in their closets for hours, and then when they were back, he would jump out and scare the daylights out of them. So jot that down as a massive red flag for later. Russell also got a girlfriend. Uh, this student from Japan and his friends all said, uh, well, he was whipped. Uh, she ran him, basically. She was also really busy and prioritized her studies and uh, just didn't really have much time for Russell. She rarely, if ever, came and spent the night with him. But he had very strong feelings for this girl, and one day, it all came crashing down. Sadly, she would dump him. Not much is really known about the breakup aside from the fact that it was a rough breakup. How did he react to the big breakup, you might be asking? Well, he didn't even touch the idea of dating for 10 years after this. Not a normal reaction. The seeds of abandonment issues were planted with the stuff with his family, but this took that to a fucking Douglas fir tree of abandonment. It was very apparent in his mood to his friends, too. His friends knew not even to touch that at all. Don't ask Russ about the breakup. But something happened that would change the course of Russell's life forever. Top Gun. Really like Top Gun. Like, a lot. So much so that after graduating and getting his degree, he turned to his friends and was like, Hey, you know all that political science stuff? Uh, yes, yeah, screw that. I want to fly jets. I'm going to be a pilot. And his friends were like, Oh, God, no. This, this Top Gun phase is out of control, but everybody would find out pretty quick that Russell was serious. And this is around the time that he changed his name from Russ Savka back to Russell Williams. Russell joined the Canadian forces in 1987, got his flying wings in 1990, got posted over in Manitoba where he worked as an instructor for two years, was promoted to captain, and 1991, absolutely flooring everyone that knew him, Russell suddenly announced that he was getting married. Mary Elizabeth Harriman, who was an applied science graduate and would go on to become associate director of the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada. In 1994, he got transferred to Ottawa, where he would start doing one of the main things that he would go on to do, which was transporting very important people. There he is with the Queen. Over the next number of years, Russell just continued to climb the ladder. Major, Lieutenant Colonel, got his Masters of Defense Studies, was appointed commanding officer at this top secret US military base over in Dubai, and in 2009, Russell Williams would become Colonel Russell Williams. Commanding officer at CFB Trenton, which is the largest and most important airbase in all of Canada. The position encompassed a hell of a lot and required a certain cut of person. And to be calm under pressure on the ball with making big decisions was responsible for like 2,300 men and women, responsible for deploying troops, all kinds of stuff. Flew the Prime Minister, flew the Queen. He also had to be a public figure and appear at all kinds of different events from hockey games to fundraisers and had to just be all around personable and likable, which he was. Everything seemed to be going great for him. Him and his wife, quote, golfed and gardened. They lived in this nice house over in Orleans, Ottawa, and were just starting construction on his wife's big dream home over in Westboro Village. But also during this time, despite being given residence on the base in Trenton, Williams also had this little cottage that he bought with his wife back in 2004 in the tiny community of Tweed, Ontario, which is about 45 minutes away from the base that he worked at. He'd go back home on the weekends, but would stay during the week at the cottage, all by his lonesome self with his thoughts. By 2007, Russell had been dealing with these sort of peripheral urges, you know, off in the distance, just out of reach, uh, for a while. Perhaps the pressure of being commanding officer, you know, upholding that ultra respectable image uh, while also knowing how messed up he was inside and all the problems he was dealing with. You pair that with all the abandonment issues and all the other stuff, uh, who knows? But something was about to hit that tiny town of Tweed like a goddamn ton of bricks. Tweed is a tight-knit, friendly, virtually crime-free community of about 5,000 people, and it's one of those towns where, you know, we've all heard this in every single crime documentary, but it's one of those towns where no one locked their door. Well, that was about to change big time. At the start of 2007, strange occurrences started happening around Cozy Cove Lane where Russell lived in his cottage. Break-ins. Many, many break-ins. And why? That. And that. 
and all those. Crap! Crap! Mega crap! That's right. Flying the queen by day and just painful photo shoots by night. Russell would watch his neighbors like a hawk, and when they weren't home, he would climb through their windows, and we know he can pick locks. He would pick the locks to their doors, or sometimes the doors would just be unlocked and he would walk right in. He always wore a mask to cover his face, and once he was inside these people's houses, he would rummage through their drawers and steal underwear and other personal items from girls and women young as nine to early 30s. Some of the break-ins were also in Belleville, which is very close to Tweed's similar type of small town. And they also started happening back in Ottawa. Now when I say neighbors, we're talking at least in a handful of the cases, people that Russell and his wife actually personally knew. His first break-in was literally a family that lived right next door to him at the Tweed Cottage. He broke into a 12-year-old girl's bedroom, and Russell and his wife actually knew these people quite well, had been over to their house many times, and the daughter, when she was even younger, had sort of roasted Russell for not knowing how to play cribbage and taught him how to play. He spent three hours in this one 12-year-old girl's room, uh, taking pictures of himself in her underwear and finishing himself off on her bed. Another girl's room, 15-year-old girl, um, he took pictures of himself self-massaging while holding a stuffed bear. Yep. He'd also occasionally leave uh, messages typed on people's computer screens so that when they got home, they'd be able to read his d delightful message. He left the word merci on a 12-year-old girl's computer. To give you an idea of how well these break-ins were executed, there was over 80 break-ins, and only 20% of them were ever reported. Like, these people didn't even know that a break-in had occurred. He also liked to repeat break-in. There were houses he broke into two and three times. But eventually, the B&E dress-up stuff just wasn't wasn't cutting it for old Russ, and at the ripe old age of 46, he decided to take it a step further. The day after Russell got back from a trip with his colleagues to the Arctic, this woman was fast asleep with her eight-week-old baby when around 1 a.m. she awoke to an intruder. She endured two hours of being sexually assaulted and photographed before Williams fled into the night. Later that same day, as this assault is being investigated by the authorities, Russell Williams is back at the base overseeing this attempt to set a Guinness World Record. Guy was trying to pull a big ass plane. I feel bad that this guy's big day is now completely overshadowed by this. Remember that breaking in multiple times to the same house thing? Yeah, uh, over the next couple of days, Russell broke in twice more to the same house as the assault, undetected, all while at the same time attending events like the opening of the junior hockey season in Belleville. Yes, uh, I think I'll have the opportunity to uh, to drop the puck at the uh, at the beginning, a ceremonial, ceremonial uh, dropping of the puck. Later that same month, another assault in Tweed, just a few houses down from Russell on Cozy Cove Lane. It was the third break-in to the same house, first two went undetected, but on the third break-in, the woman awoke in the middle of the night to being punched in the face. She was then bound to a chair with rope, cut her clothes with a knife, which was the thing that he would do. She was assaulted for a while, photographed, all that. Uh, but when she asked, are you going to kill me, he simply said, no need for that. Soon after this, police zeroed in on a suspect, and it wasn't Russell Williams, it was his neighbor. After the attack, the woman thought she had recognized the voice of the attacker as Russell Williams' neighbor, and police swarmed the guy's house, put him through the ringer, hours of interrogations, weeks of follow-up, DNA testing, prints, all that stuff, and eventually they're like, uh, yeah, sorry, you, you ain't the guy. But for Cozy Cove Lane, um, they weren't so sure he wasn't the guy. 38-year-old Corporal Marie Franz Como was a 12-year military vet and flight attendant, and she was really passionate about her job because it allowed her to travel the world, which she loved. Despite recently separating from her boyfriend of four years, she continued to have a great relationship with him and maintained a great relationship with her stepdaughter, who she was very close with. As a flight attendant at CFB Trenton, she worked many important flights, including once meeting and working the same flight as Colonel Russell Williams. After returning from a work trip to India, Como missed her shift at work, and her boyfriend decided to drop by her house in Brighton, which was about 30 minutes from the base, and he found her 
dead. As Wing Commander, Russell would have known her exact schedule, and when she was in India, he was in her house. Russell broke in again once she was back, and had just planned on staying down in the basement until she was fast asleep, uh, but things didn't go according to plan. All of a sudden, basement door flies open, Marie Franz Como is looking for her cat, and as she goes into the basement, she finds her cat staring into the corner at Russell just lurking in the shadows. That's when he lunged at her and beat her unconscious with a flashlight, tied her to a jack post, and began sexually assaulting recording. At a certain point into this, he actually stopped mid-attack to adjust the lighting, bring over a lamp or two because his shot wasn't quite lit up to his liking. After two hours, he placed duct tape over her nose, he already had duct tape over her mouth, and he watched her slowly suffocate to death before gearing up for work the next day. There's Russell the day that Marie Franz Cuomo body was found uh, getting jokingly handcuffed, a publicity stunt for some fundraiser, who's apparently being charged with being too young to be a wing commander. He went on to write Cuomo's family a condolence letter, party it up for the holidays, issue his Christmas message to the base, welcome the Olympic torch relay, and also received some really important award for 22 years of faithful service to the Canadian forces. Russell Williams drove past 27-year-old Jessica Lloyd's home every day on his way to work. Jessica lived alone on a desolate drag of rural Highway 37 between Belleville and Tweed. She was described as being very outgoing, had a wide friend base, and it just didn't make sense one day when after sending a final text message to a friend after a night out, failed to show up to her job as a school bus coordinator and just couldn't be reached. Her family dropped by her house to check on her and all they found were items that Jessica wouldn't have left behind, like her ID and stuff like that. Interestingly, along with police, the search also included the search and rescue team from CFB Trenton, which would have had to have been greenlit by Colonel Russell Williams. A couple significant breakthroughs would happen around this time. The night of Jessica's disappearance, these two guys were heading to work around 3 a.m. down Highway 37 when they spot an SUV parked in the middle of this field right near Jessica's house, which just seemed super odd and out of place. Once the search was on, these guys went to the police and told them about this. The police drove out there and they found tire tracks in the exact location that the men had outlined. Another big breakthrough was they found footwear impressions in Jessica's backyard a set of them were Jessica's and a set of them were at the time an unknown suspect. The police then set up a roadblock on Highway 37 and began examining every oncoming driver's tires. And quite soon, up pulls Russell Williams, fully decked out in Colonel attire, and it's said that the police looked at each other and were like, should we even check this guy out? It's the Colonel! But they eventually did just say, oh, what the hell, let's check him. And oh my god, the tires on Williams' 2001 Nissan Pathfinder were an exact match. I can't even imagine how shook they must have been. But anyway, when they were done, they looked at Russell and said, okay, you're free to go. But from that point on, Williams had eyes on him. Once the authorities matched the tire tracks to Williams, they also realized that Williams, uh, you know, he told a little fib during the traffic stop. He said he was really in a hurry and just had to get out of there because he had a crying, sick kid at home. And then when they looked into Russell, uh, they realized he didn't have any kids. So that just further confirmed that yes, unbelievably, this was their guy. A few days later, Williams was asked to take a trip downtown and have a little chat. Russell really didn't seem all that worried to go talk to the cops. It said that he actually believed they were going to talk to him about his next door neighbor who'd originally come under all that suspicion. He also wore, uh, well, the boots that left the tracks in Jessica Lloyd's backyard to the interview, which turned out to uh, not be a wise choice. Let me start seeing the rest. That's a little microphone, just okay. to make sure there's nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is uh, videotaped and audio taped. Check. Uh, you ever been interviewed by the police in a in a room like this before? Or? I have never been interviewed like this. Oh no. Okay. All right. Well, again, Russell, I appreciate you coming in uh, an investigation like this. I mean, I'm sure you can appreciate it's been big news, uh, especially yeah. down uh, Belleville Way. I'm a big coffee guy. I don't know if you're. Uh, a coffee guy or well, not, but I didn't want to drink in front of you, so. No, I appreciate um, that. All right, go ahead. I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's, uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I treat pe everybody with respect. I don't yeah. want to ask if they do the same for me. Um, you're obviously not under arrest here today, okay? Yeah. Anytime you feel uh, you want to leave here, you feel free to do so. The door's not locked. Teresa will walk you down the lobby anytime you want, okay? Mm -hmm. um, 
if there's anything that comes up in our interview today, Russell, that uh, that you feel you want to talk uh, to a lawyer about, okay. um, you just uh, you just let me know. Sure. Okay. And the reason for that is I want to explain to you exactly what's going on here. Okay. Um, Jessica uh, Lloyd is um, is one of uh, four cases that we're currently investigating. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially, what's happened is over the past uh, uh, about four or five months. Mm -hmm. um, there have been four occurrences, that, like I said, that we're looking into. Mm -hmm. uh, two of those occurrences occurred in September of 2009, yeah. um, and very briefly, they were up in the uh, the Tweed area. Yeah. Uh, they involved uh, somebody entering uh, two different women's houses mm -hmm. um, in the evening hours and uh, committing uh, sexual acts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in uh, November of 2009, mm -hmm. uh, a young lady by the name of uh, Marie France uh, Como. Um, oh, yeah. yeah was found uh, murdered in her home in Brighton. Yeah. And um, we believe that there was a sexual uh, component to that crime as well. Okay. And um, then most recently we have Jessica Lloyd's disappearance. Mm -hmm. But these first two attacks uh, happened uh, not that far from my place in Tweed. The second one was, uh, was very close. Yeah, essentially, uh, Russell, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to, uh, to talk to you about, okay? Because mm -hmm. essentially uh, there's a, a connection um, between you and, uh, and all four of those cases. Would you agree? Geographically, and then I guess or I drive past. Uh, yes, I, I would yes. Have to say there is a, a connection. Yeah. I'm going to take you to a date that's probably pretty fresh in your mind. Uh, uh, the day that uh, that Marie Franz uh, called. Yeah. Um, do you remember how you found out? I uh, do. Yeah, I was sent an email. Um, well, as soon as the uh, the op staff and the base learned, they told me. How did you know Marie Franz Coleman? I'd only met her once. Um, she was on a crew uh, I was on uh, just after I got to the base. Okay. So if we were to uh, to you know do a similar uh, investigation in your background, is there is there anything you can think of that anybody may have misinterpreted or anything uh, in your history that somebody might say Russell Williams uh, absolutely did this? No. Okay. Be very boring. What's that? It'll be very boring. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll just ask you this straight out. Uh, given the types of crimes we're investigating, uh, do you get much chance to uh, to watch television shows, CSI, things like that? I do watch. Uh, I prefer Law and Order, but I do watch CSI occasionally. Yes. Okay. So you have an idea of obviously the forensic capabilities, things like that, are out there. What would you be willing to give me today to help me um, move past you in this investigation? What uh, what do you need? Well, um, would you be willing to supply things like fingerprints, blood samples, sure. things like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, footwear impressions. Yeah. Okay. Can I assume you're going to be discreet? That's possible. Yeah. Because uh, you know, this would have a very significant impact on the base if they thought you thought I did this. Well, uh, bottom line, Russell, that's one of the reasons we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Because it's tough to undo the rumor mill once it gets started. Is there any contact that you may have had with any of those four women um, that you may not want your wife to be aware of? Anything like that that we should know about to try and uh, explain why, if, if your DNA is found, it would help us understand why it may be there? Absolutely not. Are you familiar with how C, uh, DNA works? I think broadly, yes. Have you ever visited uh, uh, Marie Franz Como at her residence? No. Okay. All right. Um, so you're quite positive there would be no reason why your DNA would be in any Absolutely. of those three locations. Yeah. If there's any uh, communication or contact between you and Jessica Lloyd, you've seen her picture, right? Around the town? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Ever seen her before? I don't know. I would say I have not. Okay. Um, what kind of tires do you have on your Pathfinder? I think um, I think they're Toyo. Does Toyo Open Country HTS that make right. any sense? Yeah. Okay. Would it surprise you to know that uh, when the CSI officers were uh, looking around uh, her property? They identified those tires as the same uh, tires on your Pathfinder. Really? Yeah. Okay. Do you have any recollection at all of being off that road? No, it's not off the road, no. Okay. 
I told you when I came in here uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect and I've asked you to do the same for me. But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay? And it's not issues that point away from you. It's issues that point at you, okay? And I, wanna, I want you to see what I mean, mm -hmm. all right? This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house mm -hmm. on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January, yeah. okay? All right. This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago. These are identical. Okay. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house. This is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. This is getting beyond my control. I came in here a few hours ago and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house and I need to know why. I don't know what to say. That's, uh, well, you need to explain it because this is the other problem we're having, Russell. Okay. Again, these decisions are made by me. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a search warrant being executed at your residence in Ottawa. Okay. So your wife now knows what's going on. There's a search warrant being executed at the, your residence in Tweed, and your vehicle's been seized. Okay. You and I both know they're going to find evidence that links you to these situations. Your opportunity to take some control here and to have some explanation that anybody is going to believe is quickly expiring. And I know you're an intelligent person and you probably don't need to hear this explanation, but I also know your mind's racing right now, okay? Because I've sat across a lot of people in your position over the years, mm -hmm. okay? The bottom line is, is that as soon as we get that that piece of evidence that solidifies it, mm -hmm. DNA, okay? As soon as the expert in footwear impressions, the expert in tire impressions calls and says, yes, I've examined those and they're a mm -hmm. match, mm -hmm. it's all over. Like, don't get me wrong, I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety, got off on it, got off on having that label. Bernardo being one of them. I don't see that in you. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. What are we going to do? Call me Russ, please. Okay. It's hard to believe this is happening. My only two immediate concerns from a perception perspective are what my wife must be going through right now. Yeah and the impact this is going to have on the Canadian forces. So what am I doing, Russ? I put my best foot forward here for you, but... I'm concerned that they're tearing apart my wife's brand new house. So am I. I want to um, minimize the impact on my wife. So do I. So how do we do that? Well, we start by telling the truth. Okay. Okay. Russ, you know the right thing here. Okay. After almost five hours of interrogation, Detective Sergeant Jim Smith had cracked the colonel. And now that Russ knew he was screwed, he began to take Detective Smith down his trail of horrors. What do you want to talk about? It's a uh, pretty wide open alley. Yeah. What do you want to know? Why don't we start with Jessica? Um, I saw her in her house on her treadmill. 
He said he saw Jessica Lloyd through her basement window on her treadmill as he was driving by, and he decided right there that he was going to choose her as his next victim. The next day, he crept into her backyard and waited until she was fast asleep before breaking into her bedroom. She was blindfolded with duct tape, bound with rope, sexually assaulted, forced to pose for pictures, all that. After three hours of that, he drove her to his home in Tweed, where he continued assaulting her for another 21 hours. After basically a full day of torture, Williams got Jessica Lloyd dressed, walked her towards the front door, assuring her that he wasn't going to kill her. She thought she was leaving. I bet he... And then as we were walking out, I uh, struck her on the back of the head. I surprised it, uh, her, her skull gave way. She's there and immediately unconscious. And then I uh, strangled her. What did you hit her with? Flashlight. Over the next five hours, Williams came clean about everything he did to Jessica Lloyd and Marie Franz Como, plus the other two assault victims. He also revealed some of Jessica's and Marie's final words and how they both begged for their lives. Now the question was, where was Jessica Lloyd? During Williams' interrogation, he said, Get him out. And he led authorities to the body of Jessica Lloyd, and where was she, you may ask? One day, neighbor Larry, who'd just gone through all that crap with the cops, uh, he's gearing up to go hunting, he's in his driveway, and all of a sudden, out scurries Russell Williams. He's never friendly, never said shit to this guy. All of a sudden, flies out his front door, walks right up to Larry, and he's like, Hey, Larry, where, where, what are you doing? Where are you heading? Larry was like, hunting. Williams is like, oh, okay, super cool, whereabouts? He tells Russell about his favorite hunting spot and exactly where it is, and guess where Jessica Lloyd's body was found? Bingo. Tried to pin it on his neighbor. He also told them about his computer. You'll be able to draw images of uh, Jessica and I. What about Marie? There may be images on there as well. And the two women from September? Yep. Are you in any of these pictures? Yep. There were thousands of pics and vids from all of the break-ins and all of the assaults and murders. He also went to great lengths of hiding these pictures so his wife wouldn't find them. He would basically bury them within folders within folders on his computer and also would hide storage devices around his house where she just wouldn't look. There's a recording taped behind his piano. They also found his mega stashes of underwear and bras. In total, in all of his break-ins, he stole around 1,400 pieces of women and children's clothes. Thing. He actually had so much that he had to burn hundreds of pairs because they were basically overflowing in his houses. And he kind of just had them in boxes, duffel bags. There was a pillowcase full of underwear that they found in his garage, and yet his wife just never found any of it. And that is an interesting factor in this case. There was a lot of speculation whether Russell's wife knew or suspected something was up. But the thing is, throughout their marriage, he never really gave her a reason to be suspicious about anything. So I could completely understand that she wouldn't be rooting around bags in the garage or looking in his folders on his computer. I was surprised to read that Mary was actually at the cottage during some of Russell's break-ins, but that was probably intentional on Russell's part in case he was caught that he would be able to have some kind of an alibi if she was there. But he'd just tell Mary, hey, I'm going for a late night walk, uh, you know, with my whole camera set up. Nothing suspicious about that. I'm sure he hid his camera from her, but regardless, he would tell her that he was taking these late night walks because they helped stretch his back out. And it just made sense because he had been dealing with really awful back issues for quite a while, which uh, the whole back problems thing, we're going to touch more on that in a bit because that's actually another interesting little wrinkle to the case. When it comes to the question of why did he do this, uh, even Russell doesn't really have any answers. Why do you think these things happen? Have you spent much time thinking about that? About why? Yeah. Yeah. Sure the answers don't matter. 
There are a few things I didn't mention earlier that could have, at the very least, sped up the process of him uh, giving in to his fantasies. I don't know if this one plays much of a factor because this happened some years before Russell started breaking into houses, but in 2000, after 30 plus years of marriage, his mom broke up with his stepdad, and uh, old Russ really didn't take it well. Russell's brother said that after this, Russell basically just cut his mom out of his life completely. He he would very rarely, if ever, talk to her, and he also cut his brother out. It seems like that was just the last straw, and he just disconnected completely from his family. He did, however, continue to talk to his dad. One thing that was occurring around and before the break-ins was Russell started getting that chronic back pain around 2005-ish, and he started taking a drug called prednisone, which is sometimes said to be linked to aggressive and violent behavior. People that knew him actually did say that he started to act a little different after the back issue started coming into the equation. Also, his cat Curio. He had to put his 18-year-old cat down in 2008, and uh, it had an effect on him. So much so that when people would ask him about it, um, he would tear up. He literally had hundreds of photos of his cat on his computer posed in front of various different backdrops, and he would use them as screensavers. It's impossible to know what kind of an effect it may have had on his crimes. I mean, it did happen after he started, so it's not like this pushed him over the edge or anything, but it is important to note that his crimes seem to intensify after the cat death, going from break-ins to sexual assaults. While awaiting trial, Russell attempted to end his life by swallowing an empty toilet paper roll, um, which, yikes. He also went on a hunger strike and was put on suicide watch for a bit, but ultimately accepted his outcome and was reserved to just spending the rest of his life in prison. William's uniform was set ablaze by the Canadian forces. He was stripped of all of his accolades. He's now serving life without the possibility of parole for 25 years in Quebec. Russell has puzzled many people in the crime world uh, just with with his profile as a killer, like for one, starting in his mid-40s, very unusual. The prevailing diagnosis is that he wasn't really a traditional psychopath. He seemed capable of caring and loving for people in his life, like his family. He showed some signs of empathy in certain situations. The fact that he cared so much about the impact the investigation was going to have on his wife. When you listen to him talk, there just seems to be some level of, I mean, not remorse, but definitely what sounds like authentic shame and embarrassment for his actions. Which, how could there not be? I also think he definitely would have gone on to be a serial killer had they not discovered his tire tracks. He was a serial killer in the making, 100%. Thank you guys so much for watching. Watch the full interrogation if you can, because it's insane. It's actually used to teach law enforcement how to interrogate criminals. But thanks again for watching. Please hit the like button. Please sub. And until next time, ta-ta for now.